some consolation. I wanted to see to see Tubing in, in person. Uh, at least I can see, or other people can see me in 2D rather than in 3D. That's true. That's true. I mean, it's it's a it's an interesting experiment. Let's say. Until now, we people they like it, and you know it's also distributed across the whole world. So I can see only positive until now. Uh, can, can you stop sharing your screen now, just you know, to make the introductions and so on, and I'll let you know when we can. Yeah. Start. So uh, I will press. Wait, this is already live streamed. Okay. Um... All right, uh, so I guess then we just start uh, without music, yeah? Okay, then should I start? Yeah. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, MLSS lecture. Uh, we have uh, virtually with us uh, Michael Bronstein. Michael is a professor at Imperial College London and head of graph learning research at Twitter. His main expertise is in theoretical and computational geometric methods for data analysis, and he is credited as, on, as one of the pioneers of geometric deep learning, where they generalize machine learning methods to graph structure data. During his career, Michael has received many, many awards, as well as the impressive number of five ERC grants. He is a serial entrepreneur and founder of multiple startup companies as the Fabula AI, which was acquired by Twitter in 2019. Also, previously, he served as principal engineer, engineer at Intel Perceptual Computing and was one of the key developers of the Intel RealSense 3D camera technology. The title of uh, Michael's talk uh, in the lecture is Geometric Deep Learning. Michael, the stage is all yours, and we're hoping to hear this exciting talk. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see, share the screen. Can you see it properly? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I will be uh, only virtually. Uh, so I hope to see uh, many of you in 3D at some point of time. So uh, today I would like to talk about uh, what we call geometric deep learning, basically how to extend uh, neural networks to deal with uh, graph and manifold structured data. So basically the, the, the short content of these uh, next 90 minutes is how to do deep learning on graphs. I will primarily focus on graphs. So maybe to start with, before diving into um, geometric deep learning, let's talk about an important concept in machine learning and in deep learning in general, which is inductive biases. And let's look at a very simple neural network, probably the simplest neural network that is at least 60 years old, uh, a single layer perceptron, which just takes a linear combination of the inputs and passes them for a nonlinear activation function. Now, if we combine several such perceptrons into just two layers, basically one hidden layer, in, in this configuration, we can represent step functions. The moment we can represent step functions, we can approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy. So this is what is called universal approximation. Basically, multi-layer perceptron can approximate a very broad, practically any kind of function with any accuracy we want. Obviously, this is very important to know. It's not, it's a kind of existence uh, result that doesn't tell you exactly how to achieve it. For example, how many neurons you need, what is actually how to find the right weights to represent the function. But from the point of inductive bias, it's a very weak inductive bias. We, we don't uh, really assume practically anything about the, the, the problem and the kind of data that, that this neural network is representing. And when you try to apply such architectures to real data, you run into many problems. One of them is what is called the curse of dimensionality. So there are many ways of thinking of the curse of dimensionality. One of them is uh, from geometric considerations. So if you consider this very simple setting where you have a set of dogs and a set of cats, and you need to classify them. And let's say that the cats and dogs are represented by two dimensional features. So the easiest thing you can take is take one representative cat and draw a small ball around it and say, everything that falls into this red ball will be a cat. And all the rest will be a dog. Right? So this is what is shown here. If you look at the ratio between the volume, or in this case, the area of the, of the red ball and the surrounding in the two dimensional case, it's slightly less than 80%. But if we go uh, into higher dimensions, in 3D, it will be already about 50%. And in 10 dimensional space, it will be below 1%. So 
you see that that basically when we go in high dimension, this uh, the, the the volume of a unit ball that is inscribed into uh, a unit hypercube uh, drops exponentially fast, and it means that to approximate a continuous function uh, of d-dimensional input with uh, some epsilon accuracy, we will need uh, one over epsilon to the power of these samples in general. And this is why you need to introduce some assumptions about the data. So let's look at a very concrete example that comes in computer vision. Let's say you want to classify digits like the MNIST data set. So this is your input image. You can parse it into, into a vector and feed it into, into, um, into a perceptron, right? Into a multi-layer neural network. Basically, what it doesn't account for is the structure of the data. So if I shift by just one pixel this digit, the input will be completely different, right? Even though we want to say that this is exactly the same digit. So what we'll need to do is we need to give the neural network a lot of such examples and learn these invariants to, to translation from the data. It will be an extremely complicated function that probably will be nearly impossible to learn. Now, this was exactly the original motivation for uh, uh, what is now known as convolutional neural networks. So the earlier works of Fukushima, the neocognitron, uh, drew inspiration in its turn from works in neuroscience, from the seminal work of Hubel and Wiesel that brought them the Nobel Prize in the, in the 80s on the structure of the, the visual cortex of the brain. And basically what they observed and what was implemented in artificial neural networks is local connectivity with shared weights. And the epitome of this was realized in the seminal work of Jan de Kahn, uh, that is now we call convolutional neural networks. Basically, convolutional neural network uh, consists of uh, multiple layers. It takes advantage of uh, self-similar structures at different scales. It applies local operations with shared weights that uh, are implemented as uh, shift equivariant convolutional filters. Combined with pooling layers that downsize the image, you get at least approximately shift invariance. From computational standpoint, convolutional neural networks have a fixed number of parameters independent on the input size. So you can apply them to huge images potentially. And also the, com the, the computational complexity is linear in the input. It's order of n, the number of uh, pixels. So basically moving from universal approximators uh, perceptrons to convolutional neural networks, we lose some generality, but we gain an important inductive bias that makes a lot of sense in image analysis applications. And that's why convolutional neural networks have become so popular and so powerful in computer vision problems. You can extend these concepts to other more general group operations. So there, was, there, were, there were multiple works, in particular beautiful uh, works from the group of Max Welling, where they extended shift equivariance to more general group equivalents, which, for example, can handle rotations. Is it the end of the story? Well, I'm just at the beginning of the talk, so probably it is not. And here is a, another example of a quite different data set. So this is a molecule, as you can see. The nodes here represent uh, atoms of different types, and the uh, edges represent chemical bonds between them. And let's say that we try to predict some chemical property of this molecule. Let's say the atomization energy. How at all can we approach this problem? If we just take the atoms and stack them into a vector and then feed it, it into a neural network, basically we have a lot of different ways of doing it because we don't have really a canonical numbering of the atoms in molecules. And basically any permutation of the nodes uh, would work. So here the inductive bias is different. As we'll see, we want some kind of permutation invariance. And if you think this kind of data uh, arises in a lot of applications. So molecules are just one example. Probably the most prominent example are social graphs, where we have networks of users connected by edges that represent whether the user is a friend of somebody or follows somebody, let's say on Twitter or Facebook, and so on and so forth. In biological sciences, we have uh, what is called interactomes or interaction networks, where uh, basically there are big graphs where nodes are some biological entities or molecules, and edges represent their interactions. Functional networks in, uh, in brain imaging, for example, represent how different regions of the brain interact when uh, the, the brain receives certain stimulus. And in uh, geometry processing community and computer graphics in 3D computer vision, we work with 3D objects that are represented as meshes, which is a discretization of 
surfaces. So basically, these are examples of uh, graphs and manifolds. So what is geometric deep learning? Basically, uh, a couple of years ago, I co-authored a paper with Jean Bruno, Jan de Kahn, Arthur Schlamm, and Pierre van der Kainst, where at that time, we noticed that in different fields, there are approaches that try somehow to do deep learning on data that have geometric structure that is different from grids. And we tried to summarize and uh, develop uh, some common terminology and common apparatus to uh, treat these problems. And we call this geometric deep learning. Geometric was intended in the sense that we have some structure. So the structure can be extremely abstract. It can be, for example, the structure of a graph. And uh, this is quite popular term now. Uh, there are other synonymous names to it. Uh, some people call it relational inductive biases. Uh, graph representation learning, graph neural networks are a particularly popular framework of learning on uh, this kind of data. So the two prototypical objects that we can consider in this field are graphs and manifolds. So I will spend today most of the time on graphs. I will say a few words on manifolds, how they are similar or different from graphs. So, so uh, basically, what is, uh, what, what is the difference between images and, and graphs? So if we look at an image, essentially it's a function that is organized on a grid. So we have a constant number of neighbors for each pixel. We have fixed ordering of neighbors. On the graph, we have a completely different picture. Uh, the number of neighbors, for example, for each node can be very different. The ordering of the neighbors is not given. We can order them usually in an arbitrary way. And therefore, even the notions of invariance are completely different. In images, we can talk about invariance under translation. In graphs, we'll be talking about more general notions of permutation invariance. And basically, there are three things that we are trying to achieve in geometric deep learning. First is how to generalize filtering operations on graphs, basically how to do something similar to convolutions. Second is how to generalize pooling. And third, how to do this efficiently. So these will be the three uh, questions I will be trying to answer in this, uh, in this talk. So let's start with the convolution. And again, for basically understanding what is a convolution in the classical setting, let's take a step back and let's talk about convolution on grids in the Euclidean setting. So when we are talking about convolutional neural networks, right? basically, let's assume that we have a signal that uh, is mapped by a linear layer of a neural network to some output. So in the most general case, let's say in, uh, in a layer that is used in, in fully connected networks in a perceptron, uh, one output depends on all the inputs, right? So if we look at the matrix of weights, it is a dense matrix with n squared parameters. We can make this matrix sparse by connecting one output to just a fixed number of inputs. In this case, the matrix will have multiple diagonal structure. And in this case, the number of parameters is not quadratic, but, uh, but uh, linear. In convolutional neural networks, all these parameters are shared. So in this case, the number of parameters is fixed. It's independent on the, the size of the input. So let's look carefully at this matrix. Basically, what we observe is that it is formed by taking one column or one row and replicating it when it is shifted by one position. And here, just for convenience, let's assume that we have periodic boundary conditions, so this shift is wrapped around. So you see that in the next position, we have the first column that is shifted by one. We call such matrices circulant or toplitz matrices. And that's exactly a mathematical way of thinking of convolution. So what do we know about circulant matrices? Unlike general matrices, the product of circulant matrices is commutative. They commute under multiplication. In particular, they commute with shift. The shift operation is just one particular circulant matrix that is shown here. And the shift just moves the result of a vector by one position. So this is what we call shift equivariance. Basically, it doesn't matter if we first apply the shift and then the convolution, or the other way around, the result will be the same. So I should say that some books, especially in signal processing, call this property shift invariance. But the correct mathematical term is equivariance. Now, what, do, what else do we know about uh, commuting matrices? We know that they are jointly diagonalizable. In other words, they have the same set of eigenvectors. And in particular, we can say that convolutions 
uh, are diagonalized by the eigenvectors of the shift operator. And shift operator is a very simple matrix, so we can actually express its eigenvectors explicitly. And it happens that these eigenvectors are the standard Fourier basis. So the shift operator is diagonalized by the Fourier transform. And so is convolution. So this gives us a way of expressing convolution as a diagonal matrix in this special basis that we call the, the Fourier basis. It also is easy to show that the eigenvalues of the, of the circulant matrix are given by the Fourier transform by the coefficients of this filter of W. So basically what we get this way is what is called convolution theorem in signal processing. Basically there are two ways of applying convolution, so signal X. So we can just multiply it by a circulant matrix that is formed by this vector of uh, weights W, or we can first apply the Fourier transform, which diagonalizes the convolution. Then we do element-wise product by the spectral coefficients of the filter, the Fourier transform of, of W, and then uh, apply the inverse Fourier transform. And basically it is guaranteed that the two ways are completely equivalent. So there is a duality between the spatial and the frequency domain. So let's summarize our current uh, key insights. And I hope that this is not news for you, that it's uh, uh, well-known facts. So first of all, convolution in the spatial domain is a circuit matrix. You can think of it as local aggregation on adjacent nodes with shared parameters. The special structure comes from the underlying grid. So this is something that will be quite different on graphs. And all circuit matrices are diagonalized by the Fourier transform, which are eigenvectors of the shift. Therefore, we can do convolution in the frequency domain by applying the Fourier transform, then element-wise product, and then the inverse Fourier transform. And we also have efficient way of computing it. If the filter is small, we usually do convolution in the spatial domain in order of n complexity. If we use the Fourier transform, then the complexity will be n log n because we can use the fast Fourier transform algorithm or FFT. So for any practical purpose, n log n is almost equivalent to n. So let's now move from grids to graphs. Basically, a graph is a collection of nodes that are numbered from one to n, and pairs of nodes are called edges. So if the pairs are ordered, we say that the graph is directed. If the pairs are unordered, we say that the graph is undirected. Now for each node, we can look at the number of uh, adjacent nodes, basically nodes that are connected by an edge, and we call this the neighborhood of the node i. And the size of this set is called the degree of the node, the number of neighbors. Now, we will be interested in graphs that have attributes. So we can distinguish between node attributes that we can represent as a matrix of size n by d. d is the dimension of the, of the feature at each node, and n is the number of nodes. And we can also do edge features that are attached to each edge. And in the simplest case, it will be just scalar weights. So we call this a weighted graph. Now, the structure of the graph can be represented as a matrix, where at position i and j, we put a non-zero value if there is an edge there, and zero otherwise. And if the graph is weighted, then these numbers will be different from zero in some, some values. So if you look at the adjacency matrix of an undirected graph, we see that it's symmetric. We'll see in a few minutes why uh, this actually matters. Another important construction on graphs is what is called the graph Laplacian. So you can think of it as a local difference operator. So what it does, it subtracts from the feature at node i the weighted average of the features in the neighbor, uh, in the neighbor node. And you can express it uh, in terms of matrix vector multiplication as multiplication by these matrix that I denote by delta, which is formed by the adjacency matrix A and the inverse of the degree matrix. Now, I should say, I don't call it the Laplacian because there are many ways of defining Laplacian, Laplacian operators, and this is just one way. They differ slightly, but the idea is roughly similar. What you can use the Laplacian for is to measure how smooth your features on the graph are. So basically, if my features differ when I go from a node to a neighbor node, it will be reflected in this quadratic form that is called the Dirichlet energy. If the signal is constant, on the other hand, the Dirichlet energy will be zero. I should say that Laplacian is a, a very general construction. You can construct Laplacians on many different uh, structures, in particular on manifolds, 
this is called in differential geometry the Laplace Beltrami operator. And uh, manifolds or two dimensional manifold surfaces are usually discretized as meshes. So, on triangular meshes in the computer graphics community, uh, it is very common to discretize the Laplace Beltrami operator using the Cotangent formula. So, at the end, it boils down to assigning some weight that depends on the structure of the triangles of the mesh to each edge in the mesh. And once you've constructed it, you operate with it as a sparse matrix, as we've seen before. So what is a way of doing convolutional graphs? Basically, we've seen two ways, right? So we have the spatial way, which is local aggregation on adjacent nodes with some shared parameters, and the frequency way, which requires the use of the Fourier transform. So we, we can start with trying to generalize the Fourier transform to graphs. And this is what I will do first. Maybe at this point, uh, are there any questions? OK. So let's try to generalize the Fourier transform to graphs. And for this purpose, again, let's take a step back and look at the, at the grid, one dimensional grid. If we assume periodic boundary conditions, it can be described as this ring graph. And if you look at the adjacency matrix of the ring graph, we see, surprise, surprise, that it looks exactly like the shift operator that we've seen before. So basically, what we can, can conclude that actually we can use as the Fourier basis the eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix. And that's the key idea of the, the spectral approaches for doing signal processing or convolutions on graphs, is to use the eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix or the graph Laplacian as the analogy of the Fourier basis. And these two things are equivalent on grids because they are all surveillance matrices, so they all have the same eigenvectors. But on graphs, you get slightly different results. So the idea, again, is the same, but, but the results can vary. Now, on undirected graphs, where the adjacency matrix and the Laplacian are symmetric, they have orthogonal eigenvectors. This, will, this is very convenient because that's exactly the Fourier basis. Basically, it's an orthogonal projection. On directed graphs, the construction is slightly more elaborate and allow me to uh, skip it for the sake of simplicity. So uh, this is a reminder of how the Fourier basis looks like on uh, grids. So these are the, the good, old, well-known uh, sinusoids. On graphs, they will look somewhat different. So we see if we order the eigenvectors by increasing eigenvalue, we see that the first eigenvector corresponds to the zeroth eigen, eigenvalue. It's the constant vector. It's what signal processing people call the DC component. And as we go to higher frequencies, we will see more and more oscillations. So eigenvectors oscillate more. How do we do uh, spectral graph convolution? So this is the simplest recipe for uh, graph uh, neural networks on, uh, uh, that was introduced by Joan Bruna around 2014, I think. So just use this definition that we've seen before. So to compute conversion between X and W, apply the graph Fourier transform, basically take your signal on the nodes, project it on the orthogonal basis that is formed by the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian, you get the graph Fourier transform of X, then multiply it by the point wise by the, the coefficients of the filter. So the filters are uh, the filter coefficients, uh, the, the Fourier transform of the filter coefficient is now the learnable parameter uh, in the graph convolutional neural network, and then apply the inverse graph Fourier transform. And here comes the first piece of bad news, that the cost of computing the graph Fourier transform is order of n squared. It's quadratic in the size of the graph, because we don't have the fast Fourier transform. And this is just the part of the sad story, because we are even not accounting for the cost of computing these eigenvectors. The cost of diagonalizing a matrix can be up to n cubed. Now, applying the filter obviously costs you order of n, and then the inverse Fourier transform is same as the forward Fourier transform, so it's again n squared. So this is bad news, right? If we compare it to the classical CNNs in the Euclidean setting, there we have order of n, or maybe a worst case, n log n. Now, the number of parameters here is also order of n. It's linear in the input size, whereas in the, in the traditional setting, we have order of 1. Another problem that we don't have any guarantee of spatial localization, the filters that arise from Laplacians are isotropic. They are insensitive to direction. I will talk about it in a second. And the third, or the, the, what, the fifth problem is that the filters are basis dependent and they don't generalize across graphs. And let's see a simple example. 
So here we have a graph that represents these scores. So it's actually a mesh, but it's the same idea. And here we have a signal that is ones in the red regions and zeros in the gray regions. And what I will do now, I will apply a spectral filter that does edge detection. So the way I do it is, as we've seen before, I compute the, Fourier, the forward Fourier transform, multiply by the spectral coefficients of the filter, and compute the inverse Fourier transform. Now, if I slightly deform the domain, what will happen is that the Laplacian will change, the eigenvectors will change. I keep the filter coefficients the same. What will happen is that the result will be completely different. And this is exactly what I mean by uh, saying that the filter doesn't generalize across the lanes. You see that it's completely different, it produces completely different output. The problem, another problem that I mentioned is that the filters are isotropic. And this has to do with the fact that on the grid, we have a fixed ordering of our neighbors. We can talk about neighbor number one, that is to the left, neighbor number two, that is on our top, and so on and so forth. On the graph, we can reorder our neighbors in a completely arbitrary way. So it doesn't matter. Basically, I don't have a canonical way of uh, ordering my neighbors. So basically, I need to be invariant to any local permutations. It means that I don't have directions on the graphs. I should say that if you take the Laplacian, if you look at the Laplacian, that's exactly uh, how it looks like, right? So it averages your uh, neighbors, and the averaging operator is uh, permutation invariant. So as a result, the filters that you get are isotropic. On meshes, we have uh, a more optimistic situation. Meshes have more structure. Basically, they are um, locally, uh, uh, locally Euclidean. And therefore, we, we still have an ambiguity of, for example, how to choose the first node. But once we've chosen it, we can order all the rest of the nodes uh, canonically, for example, using clockwise orientation. So here, I, instead of permutation invariance, I have rotation ambiguity. And again, we can use it to, uh, for example, define anisotropic diffusion kernels. So let's have a second take on the uh, spectral convolution on graphs. Basically, now what we can, what, what, the way we can think of uh, convolution on graphs is the following. Basically, it's a matrix function that is applied to our Laplacian. And matrix function in the sense that it's applied to the eigenvalues of the matrix. We can interpret the eigenvalues as frequencies and this function as a spectral transfer function. And if we make it parametric with fixed number of parameters, here we go, we have a filter that is is not dependent on the size of the input. If we make this matrix expressible in terms of simple matrix operations, such as uh, matrix powers or matrix spectral multiplications, we can altogether avoid the explicit computation of the eigenvectors. And it's also possible to guarantee stability under graph perturbation, so we don't run into the situations that we've seen before in the course example. And it's also possible to guarantee localization or some form of localization, let's say exponential decay. So the simplest choice of this function is a polynomial. So we take just powers uh, up to the power p of, of the Laplacian. And here, the number of learnable parameters are the polynomial coefficients. So it's independent on the input size. And we can compute it efficiently, uh, basically avoiding the, the, the computation of the eigenbasis altogether, with just uh, multiplying by the Laplacian. Laplacian is a sparse matrix. It has a uh, as many non-zeros as uh, there are edges in the in the graph, and for sparsely connected graphs, this is roughly linear in the in the number of nodes. Also, what we can see that the filters resulting from uh, from this construction are localized. Basically, uh, Laplacian uh, affects only uh, directly connected neighbors. So, if I take the power p of the Laplacian, it will affect uh, p times removed neighbors. And you can show that it generalizes uh, across graphs and stable undergraph perturbation. Of course, you can use other operators, such as the adjacency matrix. And uh, it actually doesn't need to be uh, symmetric. Basically, you can take polynomial in any matrix. So in principle, you can apply this construction to directed graphs. So this, is, this was one of the first practical graph neural networks, uh, Chebnet or Chebyshev network, that was developed by Mikhail de Ferrar uh, Xavier Brisson and Pierre van der Geist. And it's a uh, quite popular approach in, in, in this domain. Any questions until now? Okay, so let's now talk about the 
other side of the medal, the, the spatial uh, model for graph convolutions. And again, let's look at this uh, one dimensional ring graph and the adjacency matrix that is nothing else but the shift operator. So remember how our convolutions looked like. Basically, there were uh, multi diagonal matrices with fixed elements on each diagonal. The way that we can decompose a certain matrix of this form is by looking at a linear combination of the powers of the adjacency matrix. So the power zero means identity matrix, power one means shift by one position, power two means shift by two positions. So we can write uh, the, the, the conversion in this way, basically as some polynomial in the adjacency matrix. So that's exactly what we've seen before in Chapnet. Instead of the Laplacian, we just use the, the, the adjacency matrix A. Otherwise, it's exactly the same idea. So basically, you can think of uh, the adjacency matrix as a kind of a way of doing uh, shifts on, uh, on graphs. Now you can use the adjacency matrix as a way of uh, basically as diffusing information on the graph. And this gives rise to probably the simplest way of defining convolutional graphs, what is called GCN or graph convolutional networks, which were proposed by, uh, by Thomas Kipp and Max Welling. And basically what they say is the following thing. Let's say that we have vector uh, nodes on uh, vector uh, features on the nodes. So basically this matrix of size n by d. And uh, here each row represents the feature vector of each node. So the, the feature vector of node number six is highlighted here in red. We can do two things to these, uh, uh, to, to these features. We can transform them node-wise in the simplest case, just linearly. So this corresponds to multiplication by a matrix of weights from the right. And we can diffuse, basically we can average in some way the uh, features in neighbor nodes. So this can be achieved by multiplying from the left by the adjacency matrix or any other matrix, can be a Laplacian matrix. So basically this is the simplest recipe for a convolutional layer on, on graphs. Basically we have a matrix of features, transforming it from the right and diffusing it from the left and then applying some nonlinearity. And if you want some more complex, deeper neural network, then you just uh, concatenate multiple such layers. And in this example, you have a two layer neural network that allows you to do node wise classification on the graph. So basically what we've seen, if we compare images to graphs, we've seen that in both cases, we can uh, make convolution like operations that basically are local operations. In case of images, the operation is defined in the window. In case of graphs, it's defined in one neighborhood. The structure is rather different. Uh, but in both cases, we can uh, do these convolutions or convolution-like operations with linear complexity. So let's say a few words about pooling, which is the, the other important component of uh, deep learning architectures. And basically, same way as we have pooling on, uh, on images, which essentially uh, downscales the, the image uh, by reducing the number of pixels and then applying some permutation invariant operations, such as maximum or average, we can do the same thing for graphs. Basically, we can produce a hierarchical uh, system of graphs, which are coarsened progressively, for example, by collapsing uh, nodes across edges and combining them into a single node. And we pull the features on the collapsed vertices, for example, applying the maximum or average. And we can interleave convolutional pooling layers exactly in the same way as it is done in uh, classical CNN architectures. The special thing that, that you get in geometric deep learning is actually you can make the process of coarsening the graph learnable. You can make it, for example, supervised by the downstream task. And there are several works that, that try to do it. Uh, for example, the diff pool uh, that was uh, the work uh, done in the group of Yuri Leskowitz at Stanford. So basically now we have all the ingredients. Let's talk about how we put them together into uh, neural networks. And, Basically, we are talking about deep learning on graphs. Uh, where is the depth? And if you, if you try to, to train uh, deep neural networks on graphs, you run into several problems. Some of them are pretty standard, such as vanishing gradients. Uh, some of them are, are pretty specific, such as feature smoothing. What appears that many such convolution-like operations act as low-pass filters. 
So what, what you end up with is uh, after many layers of, of graph convolutions, all the features look more or less the same. So it's like a diffusion process that averages everything on the graph. And there are several ways of dealing with these uh, with this phenomenon. One of them is by regularization. So for example, the feature smoothing can be addressed by, uh, by pair norm, which just normalizes the sum of pairwise distances between the nodes. Or other regularization that are similar to dropout, such as drop age. Uh, another approach is to change the architecture. So in most cases, it's a kind of residual connections that might have some special structure, such as the jumping knowledge networks or uh, a fine connections that, that we introduced at this year's uh, CVPR. So let's look at some representative results. So this comes from uh, from a paper uh, that, uh, that proposes known norm uh, that was published this year. And basically here, what we see is some uh, known by specification task where uh, the network has uh, increasingly increasing number of layers. So going from two layers to 64 layers. And you see that it seems that that, that uh, it, it works very very well if you use the node normalization. For example, uh, with 64 layers, you go from 58 uh, percent accuracy to 90 percent accuracy. So it seems like a dramatic improvement. But look actually at this. So compare the baseline, the, the baseline GCN, with two layers to the the super duper improved version with 64 layers. You see that actually it has deteriorated. Not on the not on the improved. So the question is really, uh, do you gain anything from that? And if we take a step back and look at the graph convolutional network, the simple architecture that we've seen that was proposed by Max Fellin, what you can do, you can simplify it by just removing the nonlinear activations and uh, replacing them with identity functions. And in this case, you reduce the architecture to this. And basically, the, the, the two weight metrics are redundant, and the, uh, the diffusion matrix can be taken as square. And this is what you get, uh, what a model that is called uh, simplified GCN. So basically, you apply some power of the diffusion matrix. So you take a few steps of diffusion, and still a linear transformation of uh, node-wise transformation of features. And it seems that this kind of architecture works more or less the same as the original GCN. So we, uh, with collaborators at, uh, at Peter, we took this uh, idea to the extreme. And basically, we said, let's compute multiple such operators. Right. So here we have a set of R operators, including the, the identity, which is the features themselves. And basically, transform them linearly, then concatenate and pass them through some nonlinear activation function, and maybe, again, some, uh, a, few, a few more layers that operate node bytes. And the key point here that these diffusions can be pre-computed. So you pre-diffuse once your features on the graph using different diffusion matrices, and then you just feed them into a standard uh, multi-layer perceptron. So it is extremely simple architecture. It's just one graph uh, convolutional layer. All the rest are standard fully connected networks. And you see that uh, if you compare it on some standard data sets to some fancy and state-of-the-art methods such as graph saint or, or, or cluster GCN, you see that they're actually, well, maybe not the best performing, performing network, but it's at least on par with the state-of-the-art in most cases. And in terms of the complexity, in terms of the inference time, it can be up to 20 times faster. So basically, this is a very simple method that, uh, that allows scalable deep learning on very large graphs. So we applied, in this case, or OGBN uh, products, which is uh, about 2.5 million nodes. We applied also to bigger graphs. Uh, it has a little bit of uh, pre-processing, depends on the kind of operators that you use, but uh, the training and the inference is extremely fast. So my question is, do we really need depth for graphs? Now, this is uh, probably a little bit, uh, a, a little bit uh, provocative question, because of course we know that we need depth, right? Depends. On, on the graph, we know that on grids, for example, you can get compositional features from using multiple layers. So of course that helps. It also happens that on uh, geometric graphs such as point clouds or meshes, deep architectures uh, provide significant gain. But on graphs with small diameters such as social networks, it seems that there is little gain. So I think the, the really the, the way that we should pose this question is for what graphs do we need depth? And uh, basically, how to characterize these graphs? Does it depend on the structure of the graph? 
it, it probably depends on the structure of, of the graph and the structure of the features on the graph. So I don't have an answer to this question, but this is uh, probably a very important question because so far, most of the uh, models that are used in this domain are not really deep. And basically this is a far cry from the situation in computer vision, for example, when it is extremely common to see uh, extremely deep architectures with tens or even hundreds of layers. This is not yet the case in graphs. So it's not clear whether it's just a lack of suitable architectures or regularization or training techniques, or is there is, this is something inherent about this kind of data which uh, makes uh, deep architectures uh, useless. Any questions at this point? Uh, yes, we have one question is related to an earlier slide. Uh, the question is, what is the problem of isotropy and what do we mean by localization? Right, so basically what do we mean? So let's start uh, with isotropy. So uh, isotropy means that you're, uh, you cannot distinguish directions. So if you uh, take Laplacian based filters on the grid, they will, be, they will look like concentric circles. So it means you cannot have something that is sensitive to direction. Now, I should say that there exists models. So we did a model that we call MotifNet that uh, allows to incorporate some notion of direction on graphs. And basically it is reweighting the graph based on the occurrence of some small uh, subgraph structures, which are called graph motifs. But uh, overall, these kind of filters are isotropic. So basically information spreads on the graph uh, the same way in every direction. Uh, now, what was the second question? Uh, the second part is what, what do we mean by localization? Right. So what do we mean by localization? If you look at uh, filters that you apply to images, basically they have small support, right? So you can represent them as, as a, a window of size, I don't know, five by five pixels, right? So on graphs, when we started with the spectral model, uh, we defined the, the, the filters as parameters in the frequency domain. Now, basically, it's like building your filter in the frequency domain. You don't know whether the inverse Fourier transform will make uh, this filter localized in the in the spatial domain, in the, in the on the uh, nodes of the graph. Now, with certain types of filters, you can guarantee it. So, if the filters are polynomial, for example, by construction, they will have a, a, a fixed support, a compact support of just p hops. Uh, in other filters, if you use rational functions, for example, you can show that, well, they're maybe not compactly supported, but they decay exponentially fast. Okay, and maybe one last question for now. Any issue difference in applying Chebnet to directed graphs comparing to undirected ones? Well, not really. So, uh, uh, basically, the matrix that, that, uh, on which you apply the polynomial can be anything. It can be directed or undirected, or symmetric or not symmetric. Yeah. Okay, then we can continue probably now and later we have more questions for the round table. Thank you. Let me just uh, keep track of the time. Um, so basically, so far the recipe for convolutional graphs that that uh, that we defined was essentially some linear combination of the known features, right? So it, we we used, for example some polynomial of the of the Laplacian or the adjacency matrix. So we can write it as some linear operator that depends on some set of parameters W that multiplies the set of features X. And the models that we've seen, whether it's Chebnet GCN or simplified GCN, fall under this definition. We can think of a more complex model where it is still linear combination of the features, but the combination coefficients now in turn depend on the features. So this is uh, more general framework and uh, typical representatives are MONET or, uh, or GAT, the graph attention networks. So let me start with uh, MONET. Basically, the way that it works, you create uh, some charting or local system of coordinates around each node of the graph. And uh, you define a system of kernels uh, in, this, uh, in these coordinates. And the kernels can be made parametric. So for example, Gaussians with learnable uh, covariance uh, matrices and, and mean vectors. And you can think of them as a kind of uh, soft pixels that allow to average the features differently on uh, local nodes. The graph attention network is a little bit similar approach. Basically, it also does linear combination of the, uh, of the adjacent nodes with coefficients that are given as a tension score. So basically, they, they are produced by, uh, by a small uh, neural network. And, uh, 
that was, that was a model that was introduced, the monet was introduced by my PhD student, uh, Federico Monti, and uh, the, the GAT was introduced in uh, a work uh, of uh, Petra Velichkois. So finally, the most general form of uh, convolutions on graphs is a completely nonlinear operator that applies to X, and uh, many architectures such as message passing neural networks or edge convolutions that are used for point clouds or what uh, Peter Battaglia calls graph networks fall under this category. So this is how message passing neural networks look like. Basically, we have a general aggregation function that is applied to pairs of features on the node X and its neighbors, possibly also edge features if there are such. And this is a permutation invariant function, for example, max, sum, or mean. So the choice of the aggregation function turns out to be important. So look at these two structures. So here the colors represent different, uh, different known features. And you see that if you take maximum, basically these two graphs are identical. The, the result of maximum in, in these neighborhoods will be the same. If we take mean, for example, we will be able to distinguish between them. But if we look at the graph on the right and in the center, then the mean will produce exactly the same result, right? But some will produce different results. So it seems that sum is uh, an operation that is more powerful, that it allows to better disambiguate between different structures. And I think the question that, that is uh, appropriate here is really how powerful are graph neural networks? What can they represent? And this is a difficult question because it, it's even not clear how to formulate this problem. Uh, graphs are a combination of discrete structures, the connectivity, and continuous structures, which are the features. So in what sense powerful? It is rather different from the, the classical setting. Basically, you can think of the, the expressivity of, graph neural, of, of standard neural networks as uh, uh, basically what class of functions can they approximate because the domain is fixed. Here, the domain uh, is different. So one way of thinking of this problem is relating it to the problem of graph isomorphism. So we say that two graphs are isomorphic if there exists a bijection between their nodes that is edge preserving. So here you can see that we can find correspondence between the nodes of the graph that is essentially reordering their nodes. Up to this uh, permutation, we'll get exactly the same graph. Now, this is a classical problem in, uh, in graph theory. Uh, surprisingly, even the complexity of this problem is unknown. So currently, there is no known polynomial algorithm. We also know that it's not NP-hard, so it's what is probably what is called NP-intermediate complexity. And sometimes it's assigned to its own class that is called GI, graph isomorphism. So this problem is uh, historically uh, has been treated uh, by, uh, by, uh, by graph theorists. And uh, one of the famous attempts to, 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 to provide a test that will tell whether two graphs are isomorphic is a paper by uh, Andre Lehmann and uh, Boris uh, Weisfaller. They actually believed that they found a polynomial time algorithm for testing graph isomorphism, which later was uh, disproved by counterexamples. So the way that this algorithm works, it's essentially a color refinement. So you start with uh, identical colors for all the nodes of the graph. By colors, I mean uh, discrete labels. And then you refine the color by applying some, uh, some uh, injective function to the multiset representing the, the neighborhood of the node. So multiset is a set where elements can be repeated multiple times. So you see, for example, that the structure of the yellow node which has uh, these uh, three nodes, uh, three neighbors, is different from the structure in this node, which has only two neighbors. So that's why they will be colored in a different way. And the, the algorithm proceeds by refining the colors until the colors uh, stop changing. At this point, the algorithm just produces a, a histogram of the different colors of the nodes. And if we have another graph, and it has uh, the, the device value lemon algorithm produces the same histogram, we can say that the graphs are possibly isomorphic. If the coloring is different, for sure we know that they are not isomorphic. If the coloring is the same, we don't know. They might, but they may not. And here is an example of a case where the, the, the WL test produces the same output, but these two graphs are not isomorphic. So in this case, we say that the WL test fails. And actually, it appears that it fails on very simple structures. For example, it cannot detect triangles. As you see in the graph on the right, it has two triangles. 
denoted here in green, and the graph on the left doesn't have any triangles. From the WL test perspective, they look exactly the same. So basically, it's a necessary but insufficient condition for graphs being uh, isomorphic. Now, what was shown in seminal papers, Shu uh, 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 and Morris, that message passing is equivalent to color refinement. I should say that these are recent works, but actually WL tests have been used before in machine learning. They're also a very famous work on uh, Weisfeller Lehmann kernels that uh, predates these works at least by a decade. So it was shown, basically these, these two gentlemen showed also that graph neural networks are at most as powerful as WL tests, basically. That's, uh, uh, this comes from the occurrence between message passing and color refinement. It actually matters a lot how you choose the aggregation function. So it has to be a special aggregation function that is injective on these uh, multisets. Uh, it's not the end of the story. There exist uh, high dimensional versions of uh, uh, vice spiral element tests, what is called KWL tests that were developed by, by Laszlo Babai. And basically, these are high complexity tests that use uh, k tuples of nodes instead of uh, individual nodes and, 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 uh, and edges. And they're equivalent high dimensional graph neural networks, uh, equivalent to these tests. Uh, again, the model of Morris and uh, the model developed by Kagai, Kagai Marol. The problem with these models is that their uh, complexity is very high. So the best uh, graph neural network that is equivalent to those three WL tests has a uh, quadratic complexity in space and cubic complexity in time. So if you, even if you try to apply to a modestly sized graphs, like million nodes, it will never work. It's too expensive. So the question is, can you do better? And I will try to convince you, this is a recent work that uh, uh, was done by my PhD student, uh, student Georgos Buritsas and a colleague from Twitter, Fabrizio Frasca, uh, where we take a different approach. And the approach is basically we want to encode each node uh, to, to, to provide it a uh, with it a descriptor that tells the kind of structure around it. So it's a little bit similar to the ideas of positional encoding. So we do it by counting some predefined substructures of size k, for example, triangles or four clicks or five cycles. And you can see here are some examples of counting uh, these, these kinds of structures in, in the nodes. And basically, this forms a descriptor that we provide uh, as additional inputs to the, to the message passing. So what do we gain here? Basically, the architecture is standard message passing. So it has linear complexity. Right? So it's exactly the same structure as the standard message passing uh, algorithm. The extra cost that we pay here is pre-computation that in the very worst case, is n to the power of k. So in this sense, it's not better complexity-wise than, uh, than KWL tests or the equivalent graph neural networks. But we do it only once as a pre-computation. And also for many structures, the cost of uh, counting them is way smaller than n to the power of k. So in practice, the results are much more optimistic. And we can show that, for example, with uh, counting only triangles, we are strictly more powerful than the 2WL, which is the standard uh, uh, message passing graph neural network. If we count more interesting structures, structures such as four clicks, we are at least not less powerful than 3WL, basically this uh, 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 higher order uh, neural network of Maron. And uh, we can show it by a counterexample. So this is an example of stronger regular graphs that uh, cannot be distinguished by 3WL tests, but cannot be distinguished with our architecture, which we call GSN, uh, graph substructure network. Now, the result here is a little bit weak in the sense that we cannot say that it's strictly more powerful because we haven't yet found a counterexample. It might be that there exists an example where the 3WL test succeeds, but the GSN fails, but we were not able to find it. And of course, you can generalize these uh, examples. So you can find basically there is a family of what is called K isoregular graphs on which any KWL test fails. So looking at some results, uh, we actually see that different structures different, uh, 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 behave differently in different data sets. So in um, social networks, for example, we see that uh, click-like structures such as triangles or five clicks uh, uh, contribute to, 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 to performance, they perform the best. In chemical structures such as molecules, uh, it is common to see that uh, the cycles perform better. 
And this is not surprising. So here is an example of predicting molecular properties on the gene data set, which is used uh, for virtual drug screening. Basically, uh, molecules uh, have very common pattern that is called aromatic readings. Usually there are six or five cycles. So like you can see here, a very uh, popular molecule of caffeine, right? Which probably many of you are drinking now with your cup of coffee. Uh, it has both six and, and, and five aromatic, uh, aromatic cycles. You see that when we introduce these structures, we see a significant uh, gain in performance because we are able to account for these structures. So basically what GSN allows us to do is to uh, introduce domain-specific inductive bias. If we know that, for example, in molecules, in organic molecules, we have these cycles, let's count them and just provide them as, uh, as an input to the message passing neural networks, and we see that the performance improves dramatically. Now, is the graph isomorphism the end of the story? And I, I believe that it's not. Actually, I think that it's, uh, we should steer away from this problem and look at it slightly differently. So, and the reason is that we are, in practice, we are not really interested in isomorphic graphs. They rarely happen. What we are interested in is in some notion of similarity between, between graphs. We can describe by means of metric or distance. So the, the WL theory results really tell you that you can say that uh, two graphs are equivalent if and only if their embeddings are equal. We cannot guarantee it for any graphs, for all graphs. We can guarantee it for some set of the subset of graphs. What we probably want to say is that we have some ground rules distance between the graphs and we want to approx approximate it using Euclidean distance between the embeddings. So this is what is called the metric geometry, the isometric embedding problem. And uh, it might be impossible to satisfy it. So we can satisfy it in some relaxed way. We can, for example, say that it is uh, approximately satisfied with by Lipschitz constant C and maybe some, some uh, epsilon uh, slack uh, or we can say that it's satisfied with high probability, some kind of uh, probably approximately correct result. So I think that should be the next step that goes beyond the, the, the graph isomorphism uh, uh, problem and the vice versa lemon test. And uh, I'm currently not aware of any results in this direction. So before we talk about what, what's next, uh, are there any questions? So really, what, what is next? Basically, somehow, when I started working on this field, probably about five or six years uh, ago, I uh, hope that it will produce the same dramatic uh, impact as uh, convolutional neural networks produced in computer vision. This has never happened. And uh, the question is, has it, basically, is it an evolution rather than a revolution, even though it's hard to call it an evolution because most of the, the, the results in this field, or at least most of the improvements, uh, are about two years old. So it's really very fast, fastly paced. But uh, let me try to outline uh, what I believe to be the, the important uh, missing points, or what should be the, the important feature trends and directions. And by the way, I uh, started writing a, a blog uh, where I, the, the first post was actually about the, the, the challenges and the next steps in uh, deep learning on graphs. So the first thing has to do with basically this uh, trinity of data, computing, and, and software. That was the key to success of deep learning, right? We have large scale data sets. We had uh, 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 powerful hardware, GPUs, and we also had software such as uh, TensorFlow or, uh, or, or PyTorch. So what is the situation now in, uh, in graphs? So first of all, until recently, uh, and probably still true now, there are no standardized benchmarks uh, that can be similar in complexity and size to, let's say, ImageNet in computer vision. So uh, recently, there has been a big uh, push in the form of Open Graph Benchmark that is spearheaded by uh, Yuri Leskowitz, and uh, I'm part of the, 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 the steering committee. Basically, these are varied, uh, large-scale, interesting graph problems of different types and flavors. And it has been announced just uh, at the end of last year, so it's, it's very new and uh, everybody is already using it. Second thing is software libraries. So when this field started, basically everybody who developed a geometric deep learning algorithm had uh, uh, very dirty and uh, uh, 
not not really working code that was published to a company paper. Now there are serious libraries that are uh, professionally developed and so, uh, sponsored and supported by the industry, such as PyTorch Geometric Core uh, DGL, the Deep Graph, Graph Library. So and it's also not uncommon to see an algorithm implemented uh, within uh, a couple of weeks after it's it's published. So it's really uh, really different level now. And uh, third. Uh, point is efficiency and scalability. So most of the academic works in this domain have almost entirely ignored the question of how do you apply these methods to very large graphs with uh, low computational complexity, with low latency, and so on and so forth, which is crucial if you want to apply these methods in industrial settings. So try to apply uh, a graph neural network to a Twitter, a Twitter graph or Facebook graph, which has hundreds of millions of nodes and multiple billions of agents. Right. So there are recently many works that try to address it. Some of them work really well. And uh, again, this is uh, just a relatively recent trend. Another important point is that in many settings, the graphs that we deal with are dynamic. So uh, social networks are a good example. Basically, uh, if you look at a graph like Twitter, it is uh, a stream of asynchronous events. When, for example, a user joins the social network and then and a new node is created. When the user follows somebody, a new edge is created. And basically, we don't coordinate with each other when we do it. It's completely asynchronous. It happens all the time. So this is what is called uh, continuous time dynamic graphs. And until recently, there have, there have not been any models that try to deal with these situations. Uh, I'm aware of uh, two main models, uh, Pigat and Jolly, and they're all maximum one year old. So. Uh, uh, with collaborators from Twitter, in particular Emanuele Rossi, who actually presented his work here in, in, the, in the summer school, we developed a, a general framework for deep learning on temporal graphs, which uh, we call temporal graph networks, and it generalizes the previous approaches, it generalizes the graph network architectures of uh, Battaglia and message passing, and it also achieves state-of-the-art results. Uh, with respect to both important metrics, the accuracy and uh, the computational efficiency. So pi order structures is another important, uh, uh, another important point to address with graphs. Most of the methods that are used in graph learning look only at uh, nodes and edges. But we know it from uh, complex network science that actually there are many other important structures, such as, uh, for example, graph motifs. So in uh, many networks, for example, in social networks, we have structures such as uh, triads or triangles. We have cliques. And there are uh, seminal papers, such as the paper of Milo, that, that uh, is uh, already almost 20 years old, that, that first observed that uh, in biological networks, for example, the distribution of such structures is very different from, from, uh, from random. And uh, probably these results go back at least to the 60s or the 70s. So triangles were studied in, in social networks. So uh, I think GSN model is probably one step in this direction. We actually did it. Uh, before a work on uh, that we call uh, MotifNet, uh, already mentioned, which takes into account graph motifs. But overall, this is very scarcely addressed. So some higher order structures would probably be very beneficial in some applications. Another important point is that so far we assume that the graph is given. In many situations, we still want to use the graph to model somehow the structure of the data, but this graph is not given. It's what we can call a latent graph. So it's uh, a setting where we want to learn the graph and the filters of the graph. Another important aspect is uh, theory. So here it, it is multifaceted. We can try to gain theoretical understanding about, for example, how powerful our graph neural networks, what kind of uh, data, what kind of functions they can represent. For example, important topic is adversarial robustness. It appears that you can attack uh, graph neural networks and uh, you can actually provide some guarantees to the performance in, this, in the presence of adversarial perturbations. So I guess everybody here is familiar with adversarial noise. So there are these uh, creepy examples where you can take an image and just touch one pixel and uh, a CNN will misclassify it. So people are afraid that, for example, if somebody adversarially attaches stickers to, to the traffic signs, then your Tesla, will, instead of stopping, will speed and will crash you into a wall. It's probably a little bit uh, far from, from reality. But uh, still, it's important, uh, important uh, 
phenomenon to, to, to at least to be aware of. So on graphs, this is actually much more interesting. And the, these are uh, pioneering uh, works from the group of Stefan Guneman at the Technical University of Munich. Basically, on the graph, you can, uh, uh, you can, for example, attack a node in the social network in, in the graph by using a few attacker nodes that can change uh, both connectivity and their features. So let's say that I'm, I'm a troll. I, uh, uh, basically, I introduce myself to a social network and I try to produce such a behavior that will affect somebody else. So it sounds like uh, like a uh, very, very non-realistic scenario, but actually they, are, they show that this is possible and they also show how to guarantee certain performance in the presence of such attacks. So the final, last but not least, is killer apps. So this is something that is uh, really extremely gratifying in this field because graphs are ubiquitous and uh, they're used everywhere. And if you, uh, if you want to work on a popular topic, so uh, this year, uh, graph neural networks were the, the, the hottest keywords, at least uh, according to iClear uh, submission statistics. And the reason is that graphs are really very basic and uh, abstract mathematical models for systems of relations and interactions, and you can apply them anywhere in science. And uh, graph neural networks are currently being used from recommended systems to, to, to particle physics. And uh, the examples I would like to show I will uh, pick them up from the domain of social networks, biological interaction networks or interactons, and computational chemistry, where we use graphs to model molecules. But maybe before that, uh, do you have any questions so far? No, we are OK. So we can continue. OK. So let me start with the social science applications. And uh, everybody nowadays talks about uh, fake news or misinformation. Right? So it's everywhere on our social networks. There is empirical evidence showing that uh, fake news and real news, or I don't know how to call them, non-fake news, spread differently on social networks. So the, the seminal work uh, from the Media Lab that was published in Science uh, three years ago showed uh, basically different patterns of propagation on Twitter. And basically, what we can do, we can look at uh, some political tweets let's say some uh, irresponsible politician tweets something and this story is picked up by, by the followers and spreads like a kind of infection on the social network. So for each such story, we can have uh, a professional fact checking, there are uh, web resources that do it, and we can label such uh, cascades of uh, 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 different uh, stories on, on, on Twitter with the corresponding labels. And we get this, uh, subgraphs basically showing how uh, a story propagates. And in a company that I, I founded with my students, uh, we developed graph neural network algorithms to automatically classify uh, such fake stories from the way they spread on the network. So you can potentially, this is very advantageous idea because you don't really depend on content in principle, or at least you can use this as an extra set of features that you can, uh, for example, augment uh, NLP-based approaches. So our company was acquired by Twitter last year. That's how I ended up doing uh, research on graph uh, neural networks at Twitter. And uh, there are many interesting problems that we're dealing with. Uh, one example uh, is recommender systems. So it's not specific to Twitter. You can find it practically everywhere nowadays. And one way of doing recommender systems is the following. So let's say that I want to recommend uh, users whom to follow on Twitter. So I have some input follow graph. I uh, try to create a node embedding. So basically the graph uh, neural network will act as an encoder for the nodes. And the proximity of the nodes in this embedding space will be representative of the probability of having an edge between these nodes. So when I apply this neural network to new nodes, I will be able to suggest uh, possible links. So this is sometimes called link prediction. So this is one way that, that these kind of recommendations can be done. Let me talk about, this is actually an example of latent graphs. So this is an application in probably the first application of graph neural networks in medical imaging, where uh, the, the task was disease classification. And um, the data came in the form of feature vectors for different patients that consisted of imaging, uh, basically brain imaging uh, features and uh, phenotype features about age, gender, uh, maybe some genetic profile and so on. 
And uh, this was the work from the group of Daniel Ruckert at Imperial College. And they uh, built a handcrafted graph from phenotype, phenotype features and uh, used the, the imaging features on this graph uh, to classify the nodes, to predict whether a patient has certain disease. Now, the, basically the, 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 the drawback of this approach is obviously this handcrafted uh, building of the graph. And uh, obviously we can do better. So this is the situation when we don't know how the graph looks like, but we use it as an auxiliary construction to uh, do normalized classification. And uh, uh, with collaborators from, uh, from uh, the Technical University of Munich, from the group of Nasir Nabab, uh, we proposed a method where we learn the graph together with the filters on the graph. Obviously, the graph is built from some optimal combination of features, and the features on the nodes are also built in an optimal way for the given downstream task. And we were able to show that we achieve state of the art results on problems such as disease classification. Another interesting uh, field of application is high energy physics. So uh, as you know, uh, in uh, particle accelerators such as Large Hadron Collider, particles are accelerated almost to the speed of light and then they're collided together. So in this bank, uh, thousands of new particles are formed and uh, they're picked up by detectors in the form of these uh, jets. And uh, graphs are a very natural way of representing these jets. So there are many interesting problems how to reconstruct the jets from just points of observations in the detectors, and then classifying these events. And uh, for example, you can tune your classifier to search for some events that uh, would be indicative of uh, some new physics or a new particle. So for example, the Higgs boson that was a big discovery with the LHC is extremely rare. So you need uh, somehow to, to, to sift through uh, billions of interactions that are completely boring and completely not interesting and find the one that potentially contains this new particle. And uh, we uh, collaborated with uh, the, the, the uh, Ice Cube collaboration. So it's a neutrino observatory in the South Pole. It's a huge detector that occupies a cubic kilometer. It's carved into the ice shelf. And uh, the reason for this size is that it picks up neutrinos. Neutrinos, as you know, are particles that almost never interact. So these are very rare uh, uh, cases when the detectors detect something. And uh, the goal there as well was to classify interesting events, neutrinos coming from some, uh, uh, some astrophysical sources uh, like two uh, black holes uh, colliding and producing something interesting. In this case, uh, uh, we also use graph neural networks and were able to produce results that are significantly better than the, the, the baseline. Another field of applications is uh, computational chemistry and drug design. And this is really, if you ask me, if I, want, or if I were to bet on one field where craft neural networks might have a big impact, is probably this. There are probably many more, but at least this is, uh, well, I wouldn't call it a sure bet, but at least it seems that uh, the impact will be really large. And here's the problem. So if you want to design a new drug, the search space is humongously large. So if we are talking about the number of synthesizable mid-sized molecules, I think there are different estimates, but it's at least 10 to the power 60. So it's more than the number of atoms in the universe. Now, the number of candidates that they can experimentally clinically test is probably in the range of hundreds or in the thousands. So there is this huge gap, huge disconnect between the, uh, the size of the search space and the, the experimentally testable molecules. So you need to bridge this gap by computational methods. And you can do quantum mechanical simulations, for example, that, that uh, predict binding between different, uh, uh, different molecules, uh, such as uh, molecular dynamics. You can do some approximations, such as uh, DFT, density functional theory. So with graph neural networks, that was uh, uh, influential work of uh, Justin Gilmer from DeepMind, that's already three years old. They show that they are able to reach roughly the accuracy of uh, DFT while being four to five orders of magnitude faster. And this really opens new perspectives for uh, virtual uh, candidate screening for drug development. And uh, nowadays it already stands at the point, well, I'm not an expert, but this is what experts in this domain are saying that it's already interesting for the pharma companies. And in fact, uh, earlier this year, there was a, a paper in Cell, the top biological journal, uh, by a group from MIT where they showed a new class of antibiotics that was discovered using deep learning and uh, one part of this pipeline was uh, based on graph neural networks. So another uh, 
way of uh, developing drugs or finding new drugs is uh, by what is called drug repositioning. And uh, the idea is we can abstract ourselves from the, from the molecule itself, and we can look at the way that it interacts with, our, uh, with other biological molecules in our body, in particular with proteins. So proteins are uh, fundamental molecules uh, that are involved everywhere in our metabolism. There are about 20,000 proteins that are encoded in, in our genes, and they interact with each other. This is, this is something that can be described by protein-to-protein -protein interaction graph. So drugs are usually designed to bind to some proteins. When we are sick, some of these metabolic processes are disrupted, so the drug is uh, designed to bind to some molecule and fix this, uh, this problem. Now, we can try to predict whether a molecule behaves like a drug or a certain class of drugs from the way that it interacts with proteins, basically by looking at signals on the on the protein to protein interaction graph. And we can train a classifier, for example, train it on uh, the set of oncological drugs that are known to have some anti-cancer effect. And this way we get a classifier that then can be applied to other molecules, for example, molecules that are found in food. Right, so I can uh, take a new molecule and I can apply to it a classifier. So the classifier will tell us the drug likeness of this molecule. And we know actually that it's not surprising because many foods, especially from the, from the plant kingdom, they contain uh, compounds from chemical classes that are used in uh, oncological therapy. And we try to map to understand which foods are rich with such compounds. Uh, we've seen that there are some champions that have hundreds of such molecules and we call them, them hyperfoods. So there are some very boring foods that you find there, such as celery or, or uh, carrot or green tea is actually very good. So uh, it's probably a good idea to integrate uh, these foods into your diet. I should say this is obviously an extremely simplistic way of thinking of it. We don't account for interactions between molecules. We don't account for, uh, for example, the interaction with the, the microbiome in, in our intestine. So it's uh, just the beginning. But it allows to produce some interesting uh, and, and, and yummy results. So we are collaborating with the molecular chef who uh, uses uh, the ingredients that we discover, the, the hyperfood ingredients, to, uh, to, to cook interesting and tasty dishes. Talking about uh, interactomes, uh, here is another very interesting work that was done by Marika Zitnik, uh, uh, formerly at Stanford, now she joined the Broad Institute. And uh, basically they looked at combinatorial uh, drug theory. Basically, uh, instead of uh, using a single drug, so uh, developing a drug from scratch, which is extremely long process and extremely uh, expensive, it takes about $2 billion of dollars nowadays and about 10 years to get a new drug to the market, uh, try to look at existing drugs. So that's what is called drug repositioning. And in particular, you can look at uh, using uh, multiple drugs at the same time. This is called uh, polypharmacy. And uh, one of the risks of using multiple drugs is side effects. And uh, you know, when you take a pill, usually you have this leaflet that tells you that don't take it with this substance and don't take it when you drink alcohol and so on and so forth. And uh, these are actually clinically uh, tested side effects. But if we take the number of drugs that exist nowadays on the market that are FDA approved in the United States, roughly 5,000, even pairwise combinations will give us billion, billions of possible combinations. And there is no way that we can test them clinically. So what they did, they used graph neural networks to try to predict the possible side effects of uh, pairwise drug combinations. And in this case, the, the biology of the, of the human body was modeled as a protein to protein interaction network. There was another graph that was uh, used to model the drug to protein interactions, basically how the drugs affect our body. And then they tried to predict edges in the drug to drug interaction graph. Talking about proteins, so this is uh, yet another interesting application. So, um, and uh, proteins are potentially a new class of drugs, what is called biological drugs or biologics, that can be used uh, against cancer. And this is what is called immunotherapy. So what you see here is a very famous protein complex that is called program death ligand or PD-1, PDL-1, that uh, the discovery and the, 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 the study of its role for cancer immunotherapy was recognized by the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2018. And uh, the way that it works is that uh, cancer cells are normally killed by our immune system. Some of them uh, 
develop this protein that indicates to the T cells that they're actually healthy. And the immune system will not kill these cancer cells, so then they grow into a tumor and then we have a problem. So uh, immunotherapy works by blocking one of these uh, proteins, either PD-1 or PDL one allowing the immune system to, uh, to take control back and to, to kill these cells. And the key problem here is how to design a protein that binds to a specific target, to a specific protein. So with collaborators from EPFL, the group of Bruno Correa, we developed genetic deep learning algorithms to design uh, what is called de novo proteins, basically proteins designed from scratch that have certain uh, functional properties, for example, binding to, to a cancer target. And this was a paper that appeared earlier this year on the cover of uh, Nature Methods Journal. I will finish with uh, applications from the domain of computer vision and computer graphics. So this is one cool example that is actually pretty old. So this was a Swiss company called FaceShift that was acquired by Apple. And now this technology powers uh, the Animoji and other cute features that you get in your new generation of uh, iPhones. So basically what you see here is markerless motion capture. You probably uh, have heard about the motion capture systems that are used in movie production to transfer the, the, the movements of an actor to, to some computer graphics generated uh, character. In this case, uh, it's the input from a 3D scanner that is first uh, uh, basically find correspondence from the, 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 the input to some canonical face model. And then you synthesize a new face model uh, from, from this canonical model that uh, reproduces the, the, the structure of the input of the input face. So we can use uh, geometric deep learning here as well. And the advantage of using uh, mesh-based convolutions uh, for deformable objects is that the filter, when it's designed on the surface itself, is invariant to deformations. So no matter how I change my facial expressions, the result of the filter will always be the same, as opposed to standard Euclidean convolutions that will depend not only on deformations, but even on, uh, on rotations of the, the object in the, in the Euclidean space. So we developed uh, the first uh, architectures of deep, deep, deep neural networks for meshes. We use them for problems such as finding deformable correspondence between shapes. And currently these methods achieve state-of-the-art results. We can also uh, do generative models. So the, the usual uh, uh, things that you see with uh, autoencoder-like architectures where you can do manipulations, arithmetics in the latent space, take a face and some expression, subtract the neutral expression, add uh, a new identity, and you get the new identity in the, in the expression of the first person. We can also use mixed architecture, where the input is an image, and uh, it's encoded into the latent representation using standard CNN, but then decoded using uh, a mesh convolutional neural network that produces, for example, uh, an accurate uh, 3D, uh, 3D pose of the hand. And uh, this was a paper we presented at uh, CVPR this year, basically reconstructing uh, human hands in the wild from images. We see that the reconstruction accuracy is very, is very good. This was the work of uh, my PhD student, Dominique Coulomb, in collaboration with the startup company Real AI. And you can see here Dominique uh, doing a demo on uh, an old version of iPhone in real time. So basically, this algorithm runs um, on a, a mobile device uh, in uh, more than 200 frames per second. And here are some nice applications. Basically, you can build a realistic 3D avatar that includes uh, uh, realistic detailed hands and, and the body. So talking about computer vision and CVPR, it's interesting how the field uh, has evolved. Uh, if, Less than 20 years ago is when I started working in, uh, in computer vision. People were uh, very uh, reluctant to, to even consider works on uh, geometric data, on 3D data as computer vision. They would say, no, 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 this is graphics, this is geometry. And nowadays, uh, everything is 3D. And uh, I think it's quite ironic and maybe representative of this uh, transformation that the best papers went to works uh, that uh, combine uh, geometry and deep learning, and the runner-ups as well. So I think I'm out of time, so let me conclude now. Basically, I hope that I convinced you that graphs are interesting, uh, very general abstractions uh, of 
relations and interactions useful everywhere in practically every field of science. And uh, it is possible to develop deep learning models that are able to account for this uh, structure, basically introducing relational inductive bias. It is very cross-disciplinary research because there are many interesting applications. It is very hot field in machine learning. There are already several success stories. Well, I mentioned one of them, probably the first graph deep learning startup. I hope there will be many more. There are already some first industrial applications. So there are some companies using graph neural networks in their production systems. Not many, but uh, it is growing. And there are many, many open questions. Very exciting, uh, deep questions that connect different uh, theories, different fields. Uh, for example, uh, some questions that I didn't mention, you can show, for example, that graph neural networks can be used to approximate and be hard algorithms on graphs, such as the, the quadratic assignment problems or the traveling salesman. So you can learn uh, heuristics for these and be hard problems using graph neural networks. And uh, formalizing these relations uh, is extremely interesting. I think I will finish at this point. I, last but not least, I would like to give credit to many of my collaborators with whom I've been working on genetic deep learning in these years. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for this amazing talk. It was really nice and very exact on time. Uh, so I have two questions here. One is uh, the following. Is this work on, uh, is there, is there work on weighted graphs or is, is it a trivial special case? Weighted graphs. Well, of course, there are many works on weighted graphs. Actually, the first uh, models assumed uh, weighted graphs, uh, but it is a special case of uh, a graph with uh, age attributes. Okay, and the, the other question is, how did you verify that the certain drug combinations were bad, specifically false positives? Good question. So, well, I don't have a short answer. So if you want to verify, so let's say the hydrofoods, if uh, you want really to verify that certain molecule is good, you need to do clinical studies, which is very expensive and very long. So what we did was a, light, a lightweight version of it. We used some uh, simple NLP techniques to mine uh, medical literature to find evidence uh, in the literature that uh, the molecules that we discovered have uh, some uh, anti-cancer effect. So for example, the, the kind of results that we get that a certain molecule blocks uh, angiogenesis, which is the creation of blood vessels, which is a typical process that, uh, that, that happens in, in, in tumors. So this kind of validation, it's probably still a far cry from saying that this molecule can cure or prevent cancer, but still it's better than uh, saying that it's as good as your data set and as good as any quantifier. Okay, one question that came now. Uh, what is the intuition for why depth doesn't really help here? Why doesn't the normal intuition of increasing power through distributed representations apply here? Okay, so I should probably uh, I should probably take this a little bit cautiously. So I didn't say that depth doesn't help. I think it depends on the graphs. On grids, depth definitely helps. On uh, geometric graphs, uh, it definitely helps. Uh, so graphs like molecules or point clouds or meshes, uh, probably on knowledge graphs, basically heterogeneous graphs, uh, it, 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 it also helps. Um, there are several reasons. One is that what you try to achieve with depth in uh, classical settings is compositionality. It seems that you don't have compositionality on graphs. So you cannot, for example, if you have a message passing neural network, no matter how, you, how many layers you put together, you need to detect certain simple structures such as triangles. Uh, so this is one. Second thing is that uh, social type uh, graphs uh, have small diameter, what is called the small world phenomenon. So uh, with a few hops, I already covered the entire graph. So it seems that inter one of the reasons that, that why uh, depth is, uh, uh, is so popular in, for example, in images, that you, it allows you to use small filters and build from them large receptive fields. Uh, in graphs, basically just three, four, five layers already covers the entire graph. So it makes no sense, at least from that standpoint, uh, to go deeper. There was actually an interesting work that argued that uh, in graphs, because the number of neighbors grows exponentially, uh, there is a kind of bottleneck. And uh, the solution they proposed, if I remember correctly, is uh, 
to do uh, message passing not only along the edges of existing graph, but create artificial long edges that will uh, that will help to break this bottleneck. But the short answer, I don't know. I don't know whether it's true, whether indeed uh, depth doesn't help, or we still haven't managed to, to train uh, deep neural networks on graphs, or there is something deeper than that, and in what cases uh, it holds. Okay, thank you. And we have also one person who would like to have a live question, Is that Janos. Uh, yes, I was just wondering about the G GSN. I think it's, uh, I, you said it's way, it's way more expressive than most other G GCNs or GNNs. But I feel like, or just by looking at the, the table you showed, the benchmarks, I feel like the performance did imp improve for many uh, for data sets, but I feel like it kind of didn't appear to improve by as much as you would expect by through the increase in expressiveness you would obtain through the GSN. Uh, yeah. Would, yeah, so, so the, the, the question is clear. I think it's, it's a very good point. So that's exactly the case, uh, the gap between theory and practice, because we can show that the networks are more expressive, but it's in the sense of uh, graph isomorphism, basically uh, being able to tell what kind of graphs are, uh, are isomorphic or not. But who told that graph isomorphism is what we are looking for in the application? Maybe it's a different notion of similarity that matters. And uh, we don't know. So my uh, and the reason why I argue that we need probably to go beyond the device fire lemon uh, formalism is exactly this: that that uh, probably graph isomorphism alone is not enough. Thank you very much. Okay, so we don't have any more questions, and I think we can continue the roundtables with the technical questions. So I would like to thank you once more for the talk, and uh, yeah.